Hey, what's going on you guys? It's Aces High here and today I'm bringing you guys something all new. So this is going to be another thing by Epic History TV, but it's going to be a series on World War One. So it's a six part series, kind of short, honestly. Each video is like 12 to 18 minutes or somewhere in there. And, uh, and basically it just progresses the war. I'm excited because it's made by Epic History TV and as you can tell from the uh, Napoleonic War series that I just finished uh, re reacting to, just finished posting, um, they have really, really high quality, solid videos. So I'm really excited to check out some more of their videos and check out the second series. Don't worry, there are other things coming up. You guys have also suggested that we check out the Ottomans, that we check out Exa Alexander the Great, uh, several things with the British uh, monarchy, such as uh, Queen Elizabeth's coronation, uh, just many things. And trust me, they're all on the list. I just got to do them one at a time. Uh, that being said, if you guys haven't subscribed to me, go subscribe to me, ring that bell. It really does help me out. And, I mean, why wouldn't you want to? I post at least seven videos a, uh, a week, and I listen to my comments. I try to respond to every single one, and, uh, I mean, I'm having fun. I hope you are, too. Uh, anyway, I'm going to sit back, I'm going to shut up, and let's get started with part one of this six-part series, World War I, 1914. Okay. 1914. The great powers of Europe are divided into two rival alliances. The Triple Entente. France, Britain, and Russia, united by fear and suspicion of Germany, Europe's <laughs> new strongest power. And the Triple Alliance. Germany, which fears encirclement by its rivals. Austro-Hungary, clinging on to a fragile empire, and Italy, seeking gains at French expense. The spark comes on the 28th of June in the city of Sarajevo. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, is assassinated by a 19-year-old Slav nationalist named Gavrilo Princip. Austro-Hungary accuses its Balkan rival Serbia of having aided the assassin and sends an ultimate so uh let me pause it real quick just a little bit of background on this i know a decent amount about world war ii honest to god i i know almost nothing about uh world war one other than what they just said i know that uh uh the archduke was assassinated and that basically started it all off ultimatum demanding humiliating concessions serbia rejects the ultimatum and austro-hungary declares war that makes Within sense. Hours, Austrian forces are shelling Belgrade. The Russian wow. Tsar, Nicholas II, feels honor bound to defend Serbia, a fellow Slav nation, and orders the Russian army to mobilize. How many uh how many rulers of Russia later is this? Um because that was Alexander II, right? I know it's not his, Alexander the first son, it's just the second Alexander. I understand that. Um, but Alexander the first was wasn't he in charge during the uh, Napoleonic era? So I wonder how many more rulers had gone by before this point. I mean, I guess it would be about a hundred years. So what three or four rulers maybe? German Emperor Wilhelm the second has promised his support to Austro-Hungary He and his generals see conflict with Russia as inevitable. Okay, the sooner the better as Russia God, this hats are stupid year on year Russian mobilization is used to justify German mobilization, followed by a declaration of war on Russia. Germany knows war with Russia means war with Russia's ally, France. It has developed the Schlieffen plan to meet this threat of a war on two fronts. First, its armies will advance rapidly through neutral Belgium to encircle and destroy French armies near Paris and win a quick victory. Then its forces can move east to deal with Russia, whose huge army will take much longer to mobilize. Smart. And so Germany declares war on France. Six million men are now marching to war across Europe. Italy, however, remains neutral. The really? The terms of the Triple Alliance don't bind it to join. See, I thought that it was a lot like uh, World War II. I thought Italy... 
Oh, you know what? No, no, no. If I'm, I might be entirely wrong. I, I think Italy actually ends up joining against Germany. Because when they win, they win a lot of land, right? And then they lose it in World War II again. Join an offensive war. The United States also declares its neutrality. President Wilson and the American public have no desire to get entangled in Europe's war. Britain is France's ally, but at first it's not clear if it will join the war against Germany. But when German troops invade Belgium, whose neutrality Britain has guaranteed, an ultimatum is sent from London to Berlin, demanding they withdraw. It's ignored, and Britain declares war. A British expeditionary force lands in France, while the German invasion is held up for crucial days by Belgian resistance at the fortress city of Liège. German troops commit several massacres against Belgian civilians. The atrocities are inflated by Allied propaganda Wow. and help turn public opinion in neutral countries against Germany. France, unaware of Germany's great encircling attack. Before we get into that, it's incredible how much uh, media and different things like that can sway public uh, position, you know, just public views on things. Um, it's, a, it's a huge tactic. Also, I just want to bring up, check out this strip of land from the Netherlands. Um, I think that connects to the Netherlands, or maybe it doesn't. What is this strip of land right here at this time? Because Switzerland's down here, Belgium's right here, Netherlands. It doesn't go through, it ends right there. So what the hell is this little strip back in the early 1900s? Launches Plan 17, an offensive into German territory. Hmm. But in the Battle of the Frontiers, they're driven back with enormous losses on both sides. British expeditionary force clashes with the German army at Mons, but the British are heavily outnumbered and soon join the French in retreat. The Allies make their stand at the River Marne, 40 miles outside Paris. Their desperate counterattack saves the city and drives the Germans back. Both sides suffer a quarter of a million casualties. Wow. The race to... I, I've also got a question. Uh, World War One was big time trench warfare. Um, was were if if anybody knows, let me know. Were trenches really going on this early in the war, or was that more of a, a down the road type of thing? The sea begins as both sides try to outflank each other to the north. A series of clashes leads to the first Battle of Ypres, where the Allies desperately cling on and prevent a German breakthrough. There are more heavy losses on both sides. The two armies then dig in along the entire 350-mile front. There it is. Seeking shelter from deadly machine gun fire and artillery shells. Trench warfare has begun. Okay. I guess that answers my question. You know, let's be real. Trench warfare, man, it's just... You've got gas, you've got diseases down the trench, horrible weather, you're wet all the time. It just, it's disgusting, it's horrible, and it just leads to so much disease and so much death. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible way to do it, to have war, you know? British warships win the first naval battle of the war at Heligoland Bight, sinking three German cruisers. Britain has the most powerful navy in the world, 29 modern battleships to Germany's 19. They now impose a naval blockade on Germany, preventing contraband goods, including food, from reaching it by sea. The aim is to bring Germany's economy to its knees and force it to surrender. That's smart. But a week later, the British cruiser HMS Pathfinder becomes the first victim in history of a lethal new weapon, the submarine-launched torpedo. Oh! German submarines, or U-boats, really? are surface range. I didn't know U-boats were around in World War One. 
I thought that was more of a World War II type thing with subs. And, and early World War II, I thought it was kind of German U-boats. I didn't realize that was all the way back in World War One. Wow. ...of 9,000 miles and can attack undetected from beneath the waves. They herald a deadly new challenge to Britain's command of the seas. Yeah. Wow. On the Eastern Front, Russian armies invade East Prussia. But they blunder into disaster at the Battle of Tannenberg, where General von Hindenburg and his chief of staff, Erich Ludendorff, mastermind a brilliant German victory, taking 90,000 prisoners and destroying an entire Russian army. The Russians contribute to their own defeat by transmitting uncoded wireless messages. A second massive German victory at Masurian Lakes forces the Russians into retreat. In just six weeks, the Russian army suffers nearly a third of a million casualties. Meanwhile, Austro-Hungary's invasion of Serbia suffers a humiliating reverse at the Battle of Tsar. Austro-Hungary's offensive against Russia also ends in disaster and retreat, with the loss of more than 300,000 men. The fortress town of Chemischow is cut off and besieged by the Russians. The problem with Russia is it's almost like they just have to hold the line. You end up taking too much of Russia and you get up here into like Siberia. I guess you can push the southern section, but up here, man, you just get cold in the winter. I, I, I guess if you're prepared for it, but we saw it in World War II where that was a problem. We saw it uh, with Napoleon's army where that was a problem. The Germans are forced to come to the rescue, launching a diversionary attack towards Warsaw. It leads to weeks of brutal winter fighting around the Polish city of Łódź, but there is no clear winner. Meanwhile, the Turkish Ottoman Empire has joined the Central Powers, declaring war on its old enemy, Russia. Turkish warships bombard the Russian ports of Odessa and Sevastopol, while in the Caucasus, Russian troops cross the Turkish frontier. Beyond Europe, the war rages on the world's oceans and in far-flung European colonies. German really? troops cross into British East Africa, modern Kenya, and occupy Tavita. Wow. See, see, this is something that I didn't even think they would talk about. I, honest to God, I didn't even think about it. I guess it makes sense. British, the British and several other European countries at this time have colonies all over the world, especially Africa. You know, so it only makes sense that they're battling between them because they want to claim those colonies. That's, uh, that's interesting. Allied forces seize the German colony of Togoland, modern Togo. But British forces invading German Cameroon are defeated at Garoa and Nsangakong. While a 3,000 strong force attacking German Southwest Africa, modern Namibia, is captured at Sanfontaine. A month later, British landings at Tanga end in chaos and defeat, at the hands of a much smaller German force led by Colonel von Lettow Vorbeck. Cut off from Germany, Lettow Vorbeck goes on to wage a highly successful guerrilla war against the Allies, tying down huge numbers of troops. Wow. In Asia, Japan... That picture uh, kind of reminded me of like Vietnam or something where people are going through you know, need to waste high water, carrying their packs and their guns uh, above the water's edge. Honors its treaty with Britain and declares war on Germany. Hmm. Japanese forces go on to seize the German naval base at Tsingtao. The German colonies of Samoa and New Guinea surrender to troops from New Zealand and Australia. But in the Pacific, off the coast of Chile, German Admiral von Spee's powerful East Asia squadron sinks two British cruisers at the Battle of Coronel. Both ships are lost with all hands. Five weeks later, he runs into a British naval task force at the Falkland Islands. Four of the five German cruisers are sunk. Wow. Von Spee goes down with his flagship. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, 
British troops seize control of the Ottoman port of Basra, securing access to the vital Persian oil that fuels the British fleet. I mean, it. after seeing all this, it really makes sense why it's a world war, you know? Um, why it's titled World War I or the Great War back then, before World War II. Uh, I just, I never really even thought about all the territories all over the world that were involved in this war. Uh, yeah, that's incredible, honestly. That winter, Austrian troops finally capture Belgrade. But the okay. Serbs then counterattack and drive them back once more. The fighting in Serbia has already cost around 200,000 casualties on each side. Wow. In the North Sea, German warships mount a hit and run raid against English coastal towns, shelling Hartlepool, Whitby, and Scarborough, and killing more than a hundred civilians. On the Western Front, the French launch their first major offensive against the German lines. But the okay. first Battle of Champagne leads to small gains at a cost of 90,000 casualties. I've got a question for anybody who is really into World War One and everything. Um, planes. At this point, uh, planes were primarily used, I know, in World War One for reconnaissance. But they also had... Uh, had it where pilots, I know that they had it where pilots would actually hold a bomb on their lap and when they got to their target they would lift it out and just kind of hang it over and then drop it, you know? Uh, were they doing that at the beginning of the war or was that something later on? While in the Caucasus, an Ottoman offensive through the mountains in midwinter ends in disaster at Sarikamish. Turkish casualties total 60,000 many frozen to death. Wow. On the Western Front, that first Christmas is marked in some sectors by a short truce and games of football in no man's land. Really? So, between the trenches. All right, you guys, let's talk about that. Um, first off, that's incredible that uh, Christmas can bring everybody together like that, and they actually have a truce for a day. Um, I, mean, I mean, not everywhere, but certain areas, and that they would venture out in no man's land. And I did actually know that term. That's the area, I, I believe that's the area in the middle of the two front trenches where they'd be shooting at each other, you know? Uh, and I'm assuming they called that because you, you would find nobody out there. Because uh, I guess anybody that goes out there gets shot. I'm, I'm not really sure the exact meaning. Uh, but anyway, it's it's interesting. You know, uh, it's a it's going to be a tough war. Trench warfare is nothing to mess around with. I know that there's a lot of chemical warfare that went on in World War One, and uh, like I said, I'm pretty sure that that was the first war to bring in planes. Um, so that made all the difference as well. Um, to have something from the air, especially. Especially, even if they can't shoot and everything, if they could, like, drop a small bomb or, or even just reconnaissance from the air. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, but anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. This is Aces High. Till next time, I'm out.